He intervened on behalf of humanity who had rebelled against him in the midst of his creation. He intervened and the only possible pathway was to send his son to become one of us, the incarnation, to show us the kingdom of God. And the differentiation between the kingdom of God and our own earthly kingdoms was so great and threatened our own authority so much, we killed him. If we respond to that casually or with indifference or with a complete rejection, there's very little left for us. It's an honor to be with you today. We're talking about God's investment strategy. I spent my life in church world and one of the biggest challenges in churches just in general is low morale. You know, we don't think of the great accomplishments of our life typically being associated with church. They come from corporate settings or business settings or places where our hobbies matter to us. But the truth is God gave his son for his people, the church. Jesus said, I'll build my church and hell itself won't be able to stop it. The more we can align our imagination with God's investment strategy, the more significance we will attach to our faith and our relationship with the living God. You matter to Him. You are of tremendous significance in His purposes in the earth today. Grab your Bible and a notepad. Open your heart. God's strategy is rooted in an idea. And I gave you the menu of the words. Redeem is a verb. It's an action. Redemption is a noun. Redemptive is an adjective. It means it's something that we would act upon. But that idea of being redeemed or redemption or redemptive activity is the answer to the problem that we face. To be redeemed is to be bought out of some place. You, you redeem something that you have pawned. You redeem your jacket or your coat that you've given to someone at a coat check. You give them the ticket and, and you get it back. You redeem your car if you've parked it someplace and they've exchanged a ticket. And you give it to somebody to go get your car while you wait for it. Well, the Bible says we've been redeemed from an empty way of life. We've been redeemed from a pathway to destruction. We didn't redeem ourselves. We didn't outthink evil or outwork evil. We didn't accumulate enough assets that God said, well, in your case, you come in. God intervened on our behalf. In Jeremiah 15 and verse 21, it says, I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. Is there any question that cruelty is growing in the earth? What are we going to do about that? A new politician, a bigger army, more weapons? How about the redemptive power of the creator? In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. It's a noun. It's something that we have been, has been extended to us. The redemption, the forgiveness of sins, not those that need to be forgiven by us, the recognition that we need to be forgiven. Most of us are far more aware of the transgressions of others than we are our own. Very few of us march or protest or express our voices because of our own transgressions. And redemption comes to us when we can acknowledge our need of forgiveness. I have a question, and it's an important question. We spent the previous session on it entirely. Do you believe the gospel is enough? I sit with Christian leaders frequently, and I'll give you my, my, my assessment of that. No, we don't. It's not a question for the unbelievers. We know the unbelievers don't think the gospel is enough. Or they would be believers. The question is to those of us that imagine ourselves to be God's people, do we believe the gospel is enough? Is the redemptive power of God sufficient to change the course of human destiny? God made a very precious investment. In Isaiah 52 and verse 3, it says, This is what the Lord says, You were sold for nothing, and without money you'll be redeemed. We weren't redeemed with gold or silver. Not diamonds. Not nations. God didn't bargain or barter for us. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, You know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. 
from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, of a Messiah. Christ is not the family name of Jesus. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. But for a casual listener, sometimes we hear the, the words go together. It's a title attributed to Jesus. There were many people named Jesus in Israel in the first century. He's often referred to as Jesus from Nazareth. He was the Jesus that came from Nazareth. But when it, when it became aware of who he was, the title was attached to his name. He's Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God. We were redeemed with the precious blood of the Messiah, a lamb without blemish or defect. Hebrews 9 and verse 12, he didn't enter. It's speaking of the, the holy of holies in the heavens. The Bible tells us that what we see on earth is just a, a representation of the greater reality, which is spiritual. That's another day's discussion. He didn't enter by means of the bloods or goats or calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood. He had to shed his blood. You see, the high priest would come into the Holy of Holies once a year with a basin, and in it was the blood of the, the pastor, of the sacrificial lamb. To be sprinkled on the mercy seat is an atonement, a covering for the sins of the people. But Jesus didn't come to atone for our sins. He came to pay the price for them, to redeem us, to pay the ticket, to get us out of a future condemned to separation from the creator. Hebrews 13, Jesus suffered outside the city gate. You couldn't be crucified by Jewish rules inside the city gate. So he suffered outside the walls of the city. Why? To make the people holy through his own blood. It took Jesus' shed blood, the, the sacrifice of his life in order for you and I to be redeemed. See, that demands respect. If it's treated casually, if it's, key, if it's treated with a, a marginal indifference, yeah, 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 I, I know that. What's the big deal? Excuse me? Excuse me. Just that emotion reflects such an ignorance of Scripture that it's startling. This isn't about me. If there is a God, and I believe there is, and if he's the creator of all things, and I believe he is, and if he saw the condition of humanity and decided to intervene inexplicably, which is what the Scripture says, he didn't intervene on behalf of the third of the angels who rebelled against him. They're doomed. He intervened on behalf of humanity who had rebelled against him in the midst of his creation. He intervened and the only possible pathway was to send his son to become one of us, the incarnation, to show us the kingdom of God. And the differentiation between the kingdom of God and our own earthly kingdoms was so great and threatened our own authority so much, we killed him. If we respond to that casually or with indifference or with a complete rejection, there's very little left for us. Forget the pagans. Forget the people that have said the gospel's not enough. We're focusing in this particular talk about those of us that said, yeah, we think there may be some credence to this gospel thing. What's the respect we give it? There was a legal exchange, a legal exchange, not a theological debate, we were purchased out from under the authority of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, so that we could participate in the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6 says, do you not know? And when it starts with that, the answer is no, I probably don't. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. We treat this really cheaply. All you have to do is say a prayer. No, oh, really, it's all you got to do. Nothing to it. Everybody's welcome. Well, it's true, everybody's welcome, but there's something to it. Your future's in the balance. And once you've received it, you're not Lord anymore. It's no longer your life and your time and your calendar and your checkbook and your resources and your job and your dream. Lose that notion. It's deceptive. If we call Jesus Lord, he's Lord of the whole thing. Well, pastor, you know, I don't want to be a fanatic. Oh, really? What are you going to see the boss? Say, Look, I was just looking to see how close I could get to the line. I didn't want to go over it. I mean, I appreciate what you did for me and all, but, you know, I didn't want to, like, go all in. I don't think so. 
I don't think so. We were bought at a price. Acts 20, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Did you hear that? Be careful how you treat the church. I'm not asking you to treat me with kid gloves. I'm, I'm telling you the church is Jesus' idea. He's the head of the church. He said he would build his church and hell itself wouldn't stop it. And it required the shedding of his blood, the offering of his life in order to establish the church. The church matters. Oh, in all of our brokenness, we're filled with people. If only perfect people got in the church, we'd be in the parking lot today. And church is not about buildings or architects or theological statements. We understand that. It's comprised of those men and women who've named Jesus as Lord of their lives. He bought with his own blood. Watch the next sentence. I know that after I leave, this is Paul, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. It's a very savage wolves. You've been around a bad dog. My father was a veterinarian. From time to time, they'd bring a, a dog into the clinic that was a little too aggressive. That's the way the owners would describe him. Well, you know, Fluffy's a little aggressive. <laughs> you know, I'm work the counter sometimes. I say, well, tell me about Fluffy. He's a Rottweiler. Okay. <laughs> you know how much Fluffy weighs? Yeah, about 90 pounds. When you say he's aggressive, why, why would you say that? Well, he went through a plate glass window to get to the UPS delivery person. <laughs> True story. Yeah, aggressive. Savage wolves will come in among you to destroy the flock. Not from outside. See, the same people who lie, cheat, and steal Monday through Saturday show up at worship on Sunday. Look at the person on your right and say, I think he's talking about us. <laughs> now, we're in process. I didn't just call you a thief. <laughs> exactly. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples after them. So be on your guard. But the foundation of it all is we were bought with his own blood. Revelation 5, they sang a new song. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God. What an interesting phrase. With your blood, you purchased men for God. That is the literal explanation of redemption. What was the price that we could be in the kingdom of God? The precious blood of Jesus from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God and to reign on the earth. How did that happen? Because we joined the church? Uh-uh. Because we read our Bibles? Nope. Because we're better than our neighbors, huh? Because there was a price paid that we couldn't pay. We had nothing with which we could respond. Revelation 14, these are those who didn't defile themselves with women, but they kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men. Again, the language is intriguing to me. It wasn't the men who volunteered. It wasn't the kind people. There'll be kind people in hell. There'll be generous people there. There'll be people who do good things. The difference is, have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you acknowledged Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you serve him as Lord of your life? Hey, it's Pastor Allen. I want to interrupt the message for just a moment. I have something that I think will be a strength to you. No surprise, we're walking through a season of tremendous shaking. It may have begun with COVID, but it's continued far beyond that now. This is no longer just about a virus. And I think in the midst of it, God is moving. Not a fearful time, but a very important time to know how to stabilize our lives, our families, our homes, our businesses, most of all, our heart. Well, the most important, if you ask me for the single most important thing I know, it's a systematic daily Bible reading. That will do more to ground you than anything I know. But we've built alongside of that a little daily devotional called Standing Firm. 
And it's really intended as a companion for your Bible reading, a little short uh, reminder each day of the faithfulness of God and how it will bring stability to your life. Something you can read, share with your family or a friend. We've put it together in a devotional. I believe it'll be a blessing to you. Get a copy and spend time every day in your Bible and learn to stand firm. Standing firm in our faith is not a passive response. We must be overcomers, and that requires intentionally drawing close to God every day. Pastor Allen's one-year devotional book, Standing Firm, can help give us strength with scripture, encouragement, and prayer every day. And it's a quick and easy addition to your Bible reading time. It's your generosity that enables Alan Jackson Ministries to spread salt and light across the nation with messages like this one through radio, television, and the internet. And we're so grateful for your partnership. So today, when you donate $25 or more, we'll send you the Standing Firm devotional. Read it each day and let it encourage you to boldly stand for your faith where you live and work. Request yours when donating today by going to alanjackson.com or by calling 800-880-5102. Getting the latest messages from Pastor Allen has never been easier with the Allen Jackson Ministries app. You can watch and share your favorite television broadcast whenever you'd like. Plus, take part in any of the live stream services from World Outreach Church. If you're on the go, listen to the latest podcast and radio programs as you go about your day. We want to make sure you have tools to help you grow in your faith. Find useful resources like devotionals, daily prayers, and small group studies designed to help you in your spiritual life. Plus, you can join us in our daily Bible reading plan, read it on the app, or let the app read it to you. You can even partner with us in the ministry to help make our messages available for free in as many places as possible. Wherever you get your apps, just search Alan Jackson Ministries and look for this icon. Download the app and be encouraged by the word today. You know, we'll be judged by our response. It's not a particularly popular message these days. It doesn't fill the shelves in the top 10 bestsellers in the Christian stores. But we'll be judged by our response. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 28 Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. We read that and we think, wow, the Old Testament's harsh. Thank God we got the New Testament. Right? Jesus, I mean, when God finished Malachi, he got Adderall. <sighs> and he wrote the Gospels. Anyone who ignored the law of Moses died on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Wait a minute, this is Hebrews, this is the New Testament. Who has treated as unho an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace. This is written to believers. This wasn't written to the pagans. It was written to the church, distributed throughout the, the empire. So if you thought about the punishment of treating the purchase price, your redemptive price, disrespectfully, just walking over it like it doesn't matter, walking over it to do what you want to do, walking over it to be indulgent, walking over it to be carnal, walking over it to be selfish, It's a sobering thing. Revelation chapter 14. The angel swung his sickle on the earth and he gathered its grapes and he threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. Last, I think Revelation, that's New Testament, right? Okay, I, th I thought so. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city and the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 180 miles. I don't think that's just metaphorical. The judgment of God. Folks, we've been a little casual. We're watching liberties and freedoms be set aside. We're watching family be redefined. We're watching sexual confusion be introduced to our children in the most wholesale of way. And we're reluctant to say anything because it might have implications for us. 
Some knucklehead with a microphone says, follow the science. You can't even follow their train of thought. What can we do? It's a very important question. I would submit to you the answer is not as complex as we would like to make it. Because if we can get the answer into some realm of complexity that is beyond us, then we're not responsible for it. But I don't find God to ever interact with us in a way that is beyond us. He gives us the insight we need to do what's pleasing to him. And it's simplest expression. I would submit to you we need to act redemptively. That's the adjective. You have been redeemed. You're the beneficiary of redemption, but we are called to act redemptively. Tell your Jesus story. Tell your Jesus story. Well, I don't know how to say it. Learn. I mean, just stumble all over yourself, just like you learned to walk. Somebody took videos. They removed sharp objects from the house when you were learning to walk because you were so clumsy. When you went to other people's homes, they childproofed them before you arrived because you were a human wrecking crew. But you still wanted to learn to walk, so you kept trying. The bumps would heal, the bruises would go away, your parents would explain them. (laughs) Tell your Jesus story. Well, what if somebody doesn't like it? I bet you've worn orange in front of somebody that didn't like it. (laughs) Surely we're not going to have a greater passion for the Vols than we do for the king. And I'm not opposed to them. (laughs) Teach the children. Let your children hear it from you in the privacy of your home. As much as any single reason in my life today. I'm engaged in the things I am because when I was a child, when the doors were closed at our house, I watched my mom and dad read their Bibles. Nobody was looking. Nobody would have known. I used to look at them and think, you're weird. Why do you do that? And I watched it persist. And I thought, you know, if if they're investing that kind of time and energy, maybe there's something to this. Perhaps I should investigate it myself. I'm not saying they were perfect. They weren't. Neither was I, neither am I. Teach your children. They're very clever. They learn far more from what you do than what you say. Tell your family. Those people that you do life with, have the courage to to talk to them about what's godly and what's ungodly. Well, they'll be offended. Yes. Better offended than to miss the kingdom. Tell a friend, the people that you hang out with. Oh, I don't want to pollute my friends with Christianity. It says something about our hearts. It would, might change our vocabularies and our habits. Tell a coworker, well, we're not supposed to do that. Who said? We've got to begin to act redemptively. We're waiting for somebody else to solve this, for somebody else to take the heat. We wish we had somebody with more courage and a leader with more something or gumption or something. Folks, it's us. As awkward as that is, we've been deployed. I know you feel inadequate, so do I. You don't have a platform that's been, not enough people care about your opinion, but I'm going to start where there are some people who care about my opinion. I'll start in the place God has given me. I'm not waiting for something new, something larger, something broader. Have the courage to tell the truth where you stand. Stop trampling the blood of Jesus if it doesn't matter. Start in your own behaviors. Be moral. Be honest. Be generous. We have the power to turn this around. What did God say in Isaiah? Come, let's reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can be as white as wool. That's our God. He's paid the price. He's made an investment. Now let's invest in his kingdom. See, how do we honor his investment? By giving ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. It's the greatest investment of your life. It matters more than anything else that you might imagine you have influence over. I'm not saying you don't need food and clothing and shelter. God said he knows we need him. He said he'll take care of that if we will start with him. 
I brought you a confession. To some of you, it's familiar. Some of you, perhaps not as much. I'm going to unpack it in some more detail with you, God willing, in our next talk. But I want to close this morning by inviting you to this confession with me. It's a confession of what the Bible says the blood of Jesus does for us. You may not understand all the words. Some of them are a bit religious, but it doesn't diminish its authority when you pronounce it over your life. Why don't you stand with me for this? God in his great mercy has begun to shake and awaken and stir. And it's because I believe he would call us towards himself. Have you found the profession? I'll hush. I testify to what the word of God says the blood of Jesus does for me. Through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed out of the hand of the devil. Through the blood of Jesus, all my sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, continually cleanses me from all sin. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, made holy, set apart to God. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified, made righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, redeemed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Satan has no place in me and no power over me through the blood of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Join us every week for another exciting message from Pastor Alan Jackson. And until then, visit us online and discover remarkable information and resources to help take your Christian life to the next level. And if you're visiting the Nashville area, we'd love to see you at World Outreach Church in Murfreesboro. We're easy to find, so look us up when you're traveling through. And don't forget to connect with Pastor Jackson every day through social media. Thanks so much for joining us and being a part of this ministry. We'll see you again next time for another encounter with Pastor Alan Jackson.